Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. Yes, of course they're serious. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Brian Auten. Happy New Year. Today we're posting an interview that Chad and I did with Susan Morales on her YouTube channel, which I'll link to in the show notes if you prefer to watch the interview instead of listen. By the way, we interviewed Susan Morales of Girl Talk Apologetics in episode 48, if you want to check that out as well. So in this interview, Susan asks us about ourselves and our background, why there are Ghostbusters references and quotes in the podcast, my contribution to the book, A New Kind of Apologist, how Apologetics 315 and Truth Bomb Apologetics started, how apologetics has changed our lives and whether or not apologetics is optional for Christians. So thank you to Susan Morales for inviting us to do the interview on her YouTube channel, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Hello, everyone. Today, we have the honor of being joined by the guys from the podcast Apologetics 315, Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Did I say that correctly? You did. And um, so we'll be talking about uh, how Apologetics 315 began and uh, a few other things. So I'm really excited to get started. So before we begin, can you guys um, tell us a little bit about yourselves? And um, yeah, we'll go from there. Who wants to go first? Chad, you go first. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I am. Uh, my name is Chad Gross. I'm 45 years old and I am married to uh, Danielle. I have two daughters, Emma and Lily, who are 13 and 14. And I am an elementary school teacher and uh, kind of on the side, if you will. I uh, run the blog Truth Bomb Apologetics at truthbomb.blogspot.com. And of course, I am the co-host of the Apologetics 315 podcast with Mr. Auden. And that's me. Um, I'm Brian. Um, I run that uh, podcast, Apologetics 315 podcast. Um, and I edit those podcasts so that when I <laughs> say silly things that we take that take them out. Um, no, I uh, live in Northern Ireland, although I'm uh, originally from Michigan. And uh, so I'm over here with my wife and three kids. And uh, I'm not going to try to remember their ages right now, <laughs> 7, 11, 14, um, Eva, Ruby, and Carl. So great fun times. I run a business over here um, that is uninteresting, but challenging and exciting <laughs> at the same time with lots of variety. But uh, yeah, doing the podcast with my buddy, Chad, and um, started the Apologetics 315 website. All right. Good, good. Um, so how about we ask uh, Chad a little bit more about his teaching experience? Can you go a little more into that? Yeah, uh, this is actually my 22nd year teaching elementary school. I have actually taught grades one through five. Um, I've taught them all. They, you, uh, I know that there once was a time that uh, you could pick the grade you like to teach and you could teach it your whole career. But uh, that is very rare, at least in the county I teach in. They are typically moving teachers all around. And uh, I went into elementary school because, honestly, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And my mom said to me one day, uh, you, you like kids and kids like you. Why don't you teach elementary school? And I thought, eh, that's better reasoning than I have at this point in my life. So I went to Frostburg State University and I've been teaching in Washington County Public Schools, which is in Hagerstown, Maryland. And uh, um, the pandemic was very interesting. Uh, not, I guess, was past tense, but uh, in the sense of we did remote learning and uh, having second graders on Zoom for six, six and a half hours every day was certainly a challenge. Uh, things are somewhat back to normal. The kids are uh, masked, of course, uh, of course. Uh, but um, overall, uh, things are going somewhat getting back to normal, and I'm hoping at least they stay that way. Okay. Um, what is this? Uh, 
a recurring theme on your podcast having to do with Ghostbusters. <laughs> do you want to about- answer that or do you want me to? Well, Chad would say that uh, Ghostbusters is the most quotable movie of all time. It's also his favorite uh, movie of all time. Correct, uh, correct. I think it is also highly quotable. Um, the most quotable is debatable, but we stick a quote in on every episode and and that we haven't run out all year. So, uh, yeah, it's a great uh, we have common. See, I grew up watching movies. And then you talk to your family in quotes. And then you have friends who watch the same movies and you pick a movie and you just talk, talk to them in quotes. So when I met Chad, somehow we just started talking in Ghostbuster quotes and applying it to everything. So uh, we thought, <laughs> well, when we relaunched the podcast, you know, let's have some fun. And uh, so we jokingly said, well, yeah, we'll just incorporate ghost, incorporate Ghostbuster quotes in every episode. And then it actually happened. So. Uh, that's my answer. No, I wouldn't. The only thing I would add is that uh, we still, to this day, uh, constantly text back and forth Ghostbuster quotes. And <laughs> while we're doing the podcast every once in a while, for people who are listening carefully, we will sneak in a quote. Uh, <laughs> my favorite instance of this was when we interviewed Dave Sterrett of uh, Disrupting Truth. And I had jokingly written on the questions we were preparing, who does your taxes? because that's a quote <laughs> that's a quote from the film and during the interview brian actually asked him who does your taxes so that was great uh i have so, to yeah. watch it now I, I think i saw it growing up but like i don't remember it so i'm gonna go yeah. back and watch it well and we certainly guys. we certainly don't endorse all the content but yes. uh just the comedy between the uh the four ghostbusters and and some of the supporting characters and the quotes uh, are just, to me, the best. Yeah, I grew up with my dad just constantly like saying lines from all kinds of movies. Home Alone, um, I Love Lucy, so I get it. Yeah, my, um, kids, my kids have to endure many Ghostbuster quotes, no doubt. It's like dad humor, huh? Yes. <laughs> now I'm doing it as a parent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, our viewers probably don't, no, but um, I actually reached out to Brian on uh, Facebook. I guess that's the way you communicate to people. <laughs> you get into contact with people through Facebook these days. And um, I was reading a book, A New Kind of Apologist, edited by Sean McDowell. And I was reading that week. Uh, uh, it's like a chapter or an article, an essay that Brian actually wrote and um that's what we're going to be talking a little bit right now but um i i just kind of wanted to introduce him to my book club girl talk apologetics and then he uh went ahead and invited me on to their podcast to uh, talk a little bit about that and um so you can check that out on their uh, website or on their podcast but um i wanted to ask you a little bit about that uh brian what how was that whole experience being where you reached out uh, by Sean McDowell on the topic? And maybe you could talk a little bit about the topic that you wrote on in that book. Well, let me go get that book and figure out what I wrote. Um, <clears throat> I just uh, remember Sean reaching out and saying, hey, uh, putting together putting together a book regarding, you know, different ways that apologetics is being done. Uh, nowadays and at the time I was uh, the lone and active uh, administrator or founder of Apologetics 315 and uh, it had become a more prominent resource when it comes to finding apologetic stuff. I was talking to Chad earlier where uh, you know when it started it was hard to find apologetic stuff on the internet you know back in what 2007 or 9 or whatever it was and uh, so that was the the idea was not to build a platform or to make a big website. It was just like, oh, here's here's a cool debate. <laughs> Check this out. Here's a cool article and everything I was studying. I would write book reports and things and book reviews and post them. So then I started doing the blog and um, the podcast and that sort of thing and interviewing scholars and things like that. And so as it grew, I realized that this is reaching a lot of people 
And so I think that's why Sean saw that as a, a new way, you know, of doing apologetics. Well, now it's it's m way more common. But, uh, you know, the the idea within the book is that you find your role within um, within the apologetic community. And again, talking to Chad earlier today, uh, I, you know, we were interviewing a really smart person, like always. And um, I always am constantly reminded of how dumb I am um, and uh, how much, I, how little I know. And where my strength lies is in maybe finding these resources and getting them to other people, uh, interviewing, asking good questions, maybe being familiar enough with the landscape of apologetics and knowing it in a general way. I'm not an expert in anything. Um, and so, but if I can get the resources from the experts into people's hands or ears or whatever, uh, then I've done my role. So I see there uh, can be content creators. There can be content propagators, people who share things and uh, share articles online. They might be doing more work than the person who, um, you know, put the content out there, so to speak, in, in, in the sense of they were the real um, effective catalyst for someone else finding it, you know. So if if you're the person who has the knowledge and, and um, training or education where you can speak with authority on a particular topic, whether it's biology or science or philosophy or theology, that's great. Your role is to be the best scholar you can be. But if if you're good at graphic design and organization and web hosting and stuff, well, where can you do that? What, find your role and what excites you in that and do it. So there's creators, there's propagators, there's people who share it. And I forget the categories I used. I, I, I should have gone and looked looked over what um, I wrote. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's the idea in a nutshell is that everyone has their role. If you're not an expert, it doesn't matter. You know, because there are experts, you don't have to be an expert, but um, if you can help get resources into people's hands and find your role and and just do apologetics online in that regard, then you are part of that chain um, that will, you know, help someone to find something dealing with doubt or, you know, answers to the questions they have about their faith. Yeah, I would definitely point people to that essay. It was interesting when... Uh... We interviewed uh, this year uh, Craig Hazen of Biola University. I mean, he runs Biola. And as soon as he got on to do the interview, that right away, he said he talked about that essay and, and how well it was written and how uh, great it was. And so if you are looking to do some uh, apologetics and uh, a ministry online, uh, it's, it's a great place to start. And like Brian said, to kind of utilize the abilities that you already have. Yeah, I'm looking at it here um, under find your role. And I think you have four categories, content authors, content artists, content communicators and content propagators. Mm. Just so if anyone was curious. <laughs> um, it's Thank you. <laughs> it's been it's been we'll include a while. that in the description below. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a little while since this book was uh, uh, new, right? Um, a few years, but. It's almost like free marketing now with all of these people on YouTube and uh, mm -hmm. websites and um, ministries like Apologetics 315. It's like you have people in the body of Christ helping like your content to to come um, and reach like way more people than what it might have. Huh? Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the creation of Apologetics 315? Um, sure. Um, back in, say, 2007 or thereabouts, uh, you know, we don't have many records from those times, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, I started a blog and it was basically I found some audio and some debates and things. And uh, I was listening to podcasts all the time while doing graphic design. Or, and well, audio files, I should say, podcasts weren't that much of a thing yet. Um, and as I would find these things, I would post them because I thought, wow, that was hard to find, but I found it. So let me just put all this great stuff in one spot. And so 
it started to snowball and I sort of am OCD in the sense of uh, once I start a streak of doing something, then I'm like, oh, oh, no, I can't stop doing that now because then I'll break the chain. And so I just started posting every day. And so uh, Apologetics 315, as it started out, was just um, all the best stuff I could find on certain resources. At the same time, uh, I met Chad back in the day. Uh, he was uh, started Truth Bomb Apologetics, and we were actively commenting on each other's blogs. Um, we might, ended up phoning each other because, hey, who is this guy? Uh, you know, he's helping me talk to atheists on the Internet. And um, so we had like a initial two hour conversation where it was like, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I got to go. We could talk for seven more hours, but I've got to go here um you know laced with ghostbusters quotes i'm sure exactly um, but uh <laughs> yeah that was a that was a great start of a um a lasting friendship and brotherhood and um since then uh, apologetics 315 has um done the podcast and there's lots of interviews uh, 150 or so well of the past um uh era where it was just me doing interviews with scholars and then it shifted uh, just this past year. So we just reached the one year anniversary of what we call the reboot. Um, and that's me and Chad working together to have conversations with scholars and, and uh, experts and uh, a little bit more fun, uh, <laughs> less, uh, you know, button up collar kind of sort of a thing. But um, yeah, that's how everything started. And now it's uh, run by Defenders Media. I don't have an active hand in that and the blog itself. Um, and now it's a, a lot of resources because there's so much stuff now. Uh, it's just constantly a feed of uh, apologetics material. So in a way, you could say that now we've reached the point where there's so much apologetics stuff and content out there that um, you almost need a filter to narrow it down. And, um, you know, because there's so much and um, which is a great thing. It's a great thing. And so that's sort of the history in a nutshell and uh um yeah we're just going to keep doing the podcast for now and um that's where my strength lies i don't as i said before i'm running a business and i've got three kids which all started within that time frame you know the blog started when i didn't have any kids <laughs> and so uh you know things have changed and uh I, so i'm focusing on what i feel is at least um the better of my strengths in that regard where I like doing the interviews and that's sustainable and I can focus on that. Okay. And how does, um, so how exactly does that work? Who, who chooses the content that goes on your website every day and your social media? Is that you or some defenders media? Well, that's sort of like Kentucky fried chicken asking them for their recipe, you know, um, <laughs> that's secrets that can't be shared. In fact, <laughs> I might not even know those secrets. So, um, uh, yeah, Defenders Media um, have have their hand in that right now. So, yeah, that's a secret sauce. Okay. <laughs> the, the question that will never be answered uh, here on my channel. <laughs> um, oh, the secret um, sauce. Okay. <laughs> How about Chad, your, um, your website? Did you want to share a little bit about how you began that? Sure. Uh, I was, uh, oddly enough, I was, um, I don't know if you'd call it obsessively, but I was regularly, how about we'll call that word, regularly uh, writing letters to the editor. And uh, I'd be in a local paper and I began going back and forth with a local skeptic. And uh, my pastor, of course, would read these letters. And uh, he came to me one day and he was like, hey, these are great. Um, I can tell you're putting a lot of time into them. He said, but have you ever thought about how you could reach a bigger audience? And uh, at the time, I was not tech savvy. I'm still not like super tech savvy, but I've come a long way for sure since then. And uh, he said to me, uh, have you thought about starting a website? And I had not. And uh, he said to me in that conversation, you know, sometimes it's it's worth having a back and forth, but sometimes you have to be like Jesus and just drop the truth bomb and keep going. Uh, you know, thinking of the rich young ruler. I mean, he kind of told him how it was and the rich young ruler decided to leave. He dropped the truth bomb, right? So I love that. 
that word and I turned it into uh, Truth Bomb Apologetics and it just started as a blog. Then it started as a church ministry. Uh, then it kind of turned back into um, more of like a uh, ministry, like an online ministry. And uh, we just feature book reviews and articles and quotes. And uh, I, I do some writing. And uh, uh, yeah, that's that's how it got started. It just was kind of a conversation with a pastor and it's kind of grown and, and evolved from there. And uh, it's it's provided us with some great opportunities. And how about, um, can you guys remember when was the first moment that you were introduced to Christian apologetics? Yeah, for me, uh, I'm 45 now. Uh, I was 24. Uh, and I reached a moment in my life where by the world standards, I was doing pretty well for a single guy, but I felt kind of empty. And uh, I was getting into some habits that I knew weren't the best. And I had a friend who was a Christian, and he kept inviting me to church, and I finally went. And the pastor did a couple things. Uh, the first thing he did is he talked about Jesus like he knew him, uh, and that intrigued me, because uh, I, I had always thought that I knew Jesus was crucified, but as far as I knew at that time, when people were crucified and died, they stayed dead. Uh, and uh, then he also encouraged his congregation and skeptics that might have been in the uh, congregation or uh, or his listeners to check the evidence out for Christianity. Well, I remember at the time that was just like evidence for Christianity. I thought I thought religions were like shoe sizes. <laughs> you know, Buddhism fits you. Uh, you know, uh, Christianity fits you. That's great. As long as it helps you as you keep to yourself, I'll keep to myself. I mean, that was kind of my view. So I, he recommended some resources to me that really led me to looking mainly into the evidence for the new Testament and the evidence for the, uh, resurrection. And, uh, I remember sitting at my house one night and I was reading, uh, about the resurrection and it just hit me like, oh my gosh, this really happened. <laughs> like he really rose from the dead. And uh, I gave myself to, to Christ that night. And that was probably at that point, I was probably 25 because it was kind of the end of the year of me being 24, if that makes sense. And so, yeah, it was through a pastor who recommended some resources to me. And a couple that come to mind was, of course, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, which was is kind of a standard, right? And then uh, Lee Strobel's Case for Christ, which was very helpful in introducing me to other thinkers, because as you know, the format of his books is he interviews other thinkers. And so, yeah, that's how I was introduced to it. And I'll well, say real I'll quick. Go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll <laughs> say real quick, too, that I had no idea. Uh, I, I, I do remember after getting saved, uh, questioning why is it that I'm 25 years old and nobody has ever told me, hey, there's actually mm -hmm. evidence for this stuff? Um, and I remember thinking, I don't want to be that person. Like, I want to be the person that says, you should look at the evidence for this, you know. So anyway, Brian, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, good stuff, Chad. Um, yeah, for me, uh, you know, I grew up in a Christian home and I went to a Christian school and my experience as a Christian was more experiential and I didn't do a lot of heavy lifting when it came to finding out if it's true. I just assumed it was true. Although looking back, I was exposed to a lot of apologetic stuff in my Bible class at school with a tremendous teacher. Uh, it just kind of like, I didn't see any need for it because Hey, it's true. And this is all just confirmation. So I didn't really internalize it or think about it too deeply. Um, although I'm grateful for it because I think it planted a lot of seeds in me. And so um, fast forward after high school, you know, I went into the mission field. And then I, after doing that, I, I went and I was working at a church and um, uh, doing media and all kinds of sort of things like that. And uh, it turned out that I had a, a sort of a poor church experience in that sense where Things went downhill in the church, and there were issues that caused me to say, well, it's time for me to leave this place. And um, in leaving, I 
thought, well, my question was, I was saying to my wife, like, I can't trust, who can I trust? You know, I know God exists, but why should I even trust the Bible? You know, so this experience of doubting and this bad church experience, for lack of better term, caused me to be like, where, what, how do I know this is true? And why should I think it's authoritative, the Bible? Right around that time, Da Vinci Code was coming out. <clears throat> and so the week that we left that church, um, we went to a different church. And that was not only our church, but it was my job. So it means quitting your job, not having another job, <laughs> and be like, I'm out of here. <clears throat> and so the following Sunday, we go to a different church, and there's a panel of Christian apologists talking about why you could trust the Bible. And it was like, wow, this is what I need to hear right now. And I'm standing up, I'm asking questions and like, wow. And I'm thinking, this is, this is what I need to, uh, you know, this is what I need to be getting into. And so I started reading about, uh, you know, why you can trust the Bible. And it was like, wow, I felt like I was almost born again, again. It was refreshing my faith, bolstered my faith and confidence. I started evangelizing like on my own before it would be like, oh, well, the church is going out evangelizing. Come with us. Now I'm like, hey, I'm going to the DMV. There's all these people waiting in line. I'm going to go to go street preach to them, you know, um, because it was just on fire again. And uh, so moving over here to the Shire, also known as Northern Ireland, <laughs> um, I continued to do street evangelism and uh, we started realizing that, hey, people are asking questions about like, why does God even exist and stuff? So these were previously the apologetics was to get my faith back, so to speak, in relying on the Bible and being it being trustworthy. But now the apologetics aspect came in to be needed because, hey, I'm trying to talk to people about Jesus, but they have doubts. They have questions I, I haven't explored the answers to. I think I know <laughs> that God exists, but how do I show that? And so uh, that's what got me just reading and reading and then finding great resources like, wow, this is a whole new world of stuff I never knew about. And uh, so that kind of led me down the road of uh, finding like resources from, from scholars and stuff. And I remember uh, going on a walk with a dog or something and listening to a podcast or a, a lecture by William Lane Craig. And he says that they need um, people in, in academia to you know influence the culture for christ and you know if you can get a degree in uh, philosophy or theology or these, these sorts of things now that would be really beneficial something to that effect <laughs> and i thought yeah i'm gonna get a degree so i uh, i ended up going getting a master's in, in christian apologetics you know i didn't get something in philosophy or theology or you know biology something but uh that's what i wanted i thought i'm going to do serious study in this area in order to really be equipped and it, it has since then it has bolstered my faith and it's helped me to you know not feel like flat-footed when i'm talking to other people um i i have good reasons that i can not only know but show to others um and it, it just it's been really beneficial in that regard okay so I'm like noticing that both of you had um, an experience uh, kind of church related where, you know, you were introduced kind of through a church. So um, I was going to ask you what, what the effect of apologetics has had in your life. And I think, Brian, you just uh, spoke on that. Chad, did you have anything to add aside from like knowing that this is true? Yeah, I would just add to it that for me, uh, during times of, um, I, I struggle with, uh, anxiety mm -hmm. and, uh, sometimes with the anxiety comes doubts, a uh, question can get stuck in your head or something like that. And I have told my wife on numerous occasions, how comforting the evidence is because when I'm having emotional doubts, I can go back to the arguments and the evidence and say, okay, right now I don't. I'm having trouble feeling like this is true, right? But the evidence and the argument show me that um, it is. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I love what he said. He said that uh, when 
when he was an atheist, there were days where Christianity looked really probable. And now that he's a Christian, there are days that atheism looks probable. And of course, Lewis's point is, is that we can't um, ebb and flow with our feelings. We have to rest on that which is true. And for me, apologetics has just allowed me to be able to rest in what is true, regardless of uh, struggles that are exterior uh, to that. And then the other thing that's been great uh, is, is that I'm able to give good reasons, not only to people, but most importantly to my kids. Uh, you know, 13 and 14, there have a lot of questions. And wow, what a blessing it is to not, a, you know, whether I know the answer, I know where I can go get it. Um, and uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to be able to say, hey, you know why you should be a Christian? You shouldn't be a Christian because I am. You shouldn't be a Christian because it works. Uh, you shouldn't be a Christian uh, um, because it feels good. You should be a Christian because it's true. And here are the reasons it's true. And that's been a great blessing. Um, did you have anything to add, Brian? No, I love Chad's point about, yeah. you know, talking to the kids. Yeah. Um, that's something that we, I try to weave in as much as possible because I'm, I'm aware of the the challenges that they're going to have growing up um, and the crazy culture that we're facing all around us. So, yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so we've seen the benefits of, you know, churches incorporating apologetics in your personal lives. And, you know, it continues to all the people that you guys have reached as a result of that. So how would you answer this question? Is apologetics optional for a Christian? No. I'm going to write my answer down on a card, and you're going to write your answer down on a card. We'll hold them up at the same time. And hold them and see if they're the same. <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, uh, I, I think the answer to that to me is, is no. Uh, but I want to make sure that I'm clear here. Uh, am I saying that everybody's focus in the body of Christ needs to be apologetics? No, I actually think that would not be healthy. We need uh, musicians. We need poets. Uh, you know, we need uh, many uh, different types of people for the body of Christ, right? Not every part of the body does the same thing. But um, the Bible's very clear. Uh, if we're commanded to do something, it, all of us are commanded to do it, right? And uh, we are commanded to be able to give a defense for the hope that is within us. We are commanded to destroy arguments that raise up themselves against Christ. Uh, and so, we're commanded to do it. Not only that, if we're following Jesus and we're following uh, those who followed him, right, the apostles, uh, you see Jesus did apologetics. Uh, when John the Baptist, uh, when one of John the Baptist's uh, men came to him and said, John wants to know if when John was in prison and he sent one of his, his followers, he said, John wants to know if you're the one that we're waiting on or should we expect somebody else? Well, what did Jesus do? He, he gave evidence, right? He said, Look at all the things I'm doing, you know, tell him to look to that. Um, the apostles, if you read through the New Testament, there are so many instances of them. When they're talking to the Jews, they appeal to scripture. When they're talking to non-believers, they appear to creation, conscience, the historical resurrection. Uh, and then, of course, we have the early church fathers who were apologists, people like Justin Martyr. And so we have not only uh, the Bible commanding it, but it's also been a pattern since the very inception of the Christian church that we're to carry on. Yeah, good stuff. You stole all the good scriptures. Um, all. Sorry. I was, I was going to say. Uh, Let me get that, my concordance. But... Let me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, get, I'll find some other ones. No. I, I don't think it's optional. Um, but like but Chad said, that not everybody has to be like big on apologetics. Um, what comes to my mind is who, what, why and how? Uh, who do you believe in? You need to know who you believe in. And, and I think that's the personal aspect of our faith. Um, you need to know what you believe. Like, what does that even entail? Um, what does that require? Um, you need to know why you believe it. So you have to have reasons for yourself. Um, but then how do you know it's true? And how can you show it's true? Um, those are things that um, sort of branch out. So you know, if you want to be a fully orbed Christian, <laughs> as me and Chad <laughs> like to say, 
uh, it's this idea of being well-rounded, um, having power, love, and a sound mind. Um, there's, you know, those different aspects where you love the Lord your God with your, your with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just part of the Christian life is being able to give a reason for the hope that you have. Um, there are times when the Holy Spirit will give you words, but we don't just, you know, oh, well, I guess I don't need to think. Um, there's enough stuff in culture where if you seriously want to hold on to your faith, you better know why you what you believe and why you believe it. And if you're going to be persuasive as a Christian ambassador, then you have to have some persuasive reasons, not just to persuade you, but to show that um, Christianity is viable in in the world today. Um, so I think we've got all the sort of stuff and the resources are there to learn how to do that. And, and if it's any comfort to the people who might think that apologetics is just for intellectuals, no, it's, it's for everybody. Um, and you know, it can be stuff way on the top shelf and then it can be on the lower shelves as well. So there's all manners of ways to talk about how, uh, you know, argument from, for God's existence, you could use some big philosophical argument about there being a first mover and a you know initial cause that sort of a thing or you could say well every painting needs a painter every book needs an author every design needs a designer and those are concepts that children can grasp and uh so why not start there and and work on up so no it's not optional um but it's often neglected yeah and i would also add to that that I think that uh, people are really uh, missing out if they don't uh, make this part of their Christian walk, because as I pointed out earlier, it can be very encouraging. It can bolster your faith. It can give you more confidence. It can be a great comfort, especially when bad things happen or you're not feeling well or whatnot. And um, also, too, as a point of encouragement uh, to kind of piggyback off of what Brian said, a lot of times when we think about giving a defense, right, we feel like, oh my gosh, do I have to have four arguments memorized and or something like that, right? I mean, a lot of times just knowing where the resources are and being able to offer them to people that have questions, that's giving a defense, mm -hmm. right? You're giving a defense. Um, and so uh, I, I think Brian and I would not want somebody to feel like that they have to be um, exhaustively uh, versed in theology and philosophy and apologetics, but it should be part of uh, the, the Christian walk. Otherwise, uh, you don't, I think, I think you'll miss out and, and not have a, as, as rich a walk with Christ as you, as you might otherwise. And if I could just throw one more thing in there, you, 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 we were talking there about how, you know, it's not over, not just for intellectual things, but, and how it enriches your life. Mm -hmm. I remember after reading about the resurrection and reading Habermas and different things, a bunch of scholarly tomes, basically, and uh, thinking, wow, this is really persuasive. You know, uh, this is true. You know, it's kind of like what you were saying there, Chad. And I remember being at this meeting uh, or sitting around a bunch of circle of chairs, and it was for opening up this like children's outreach center or something. It was a Christian little place for kids to hang out anyway and this was all doing the paperwork we're doing the paperwork they're like okay well we're gonna read the creed and uh christian beliefs and just if everybody can just go ahead and affirm it after we read it and they're just being totally formal and so someone's standing there and they're like we believe this we believe that <laughs> and then and we believe that jesus rose on as they're reading it i'm i have to hold myself back from just bawling <laughs> like a baby i just remembered silent tears just rolling down my eyes as they were as they were reading the creed like here's what we believe and because it was like wow it's true you know it's not just like well i'm just gonna leap off this tall building and see what happens uh it was like now this is true and so the intellectual aspect of christianity affects your emotions and it should affect everything so um, yeah, it's not just like book learning, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's real helpful. That's a great point, Brian. I had a similar experience when I was studying the Kalam and, uh, that set the, the universe began to exist. And I, I realized that God spoke the universe into existence and that the evidence showed that, that 
you know, the universe was created ex nihilo, just like the Bible says. I mean, it was just a worshipful experience. It wasn't just an intellectual one. Yeah. I might as well add <laughs> um, mm-hmm. something, when I started learning about how um, how everything has to be in such a precision, right? The universe or else. All the fine I, tuning, just, yeah. 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 When I first started hearing about that, I remember like I had this thing with my ear and I remember just being really frustrated and I incorporated that into my prayer, into like believing that God could answer um like move things around in such a way in my body so that it, the thing that was bothering me wouldn't continue bothering me and wouldn't you know that like that was one of like the answer uh prayers in my mm-hmm. life and it's amazing wow. how apologetics like helped me in that area you know so um That's how about cool. if there's if there's um someone that it is like knows nothing about apologetics but they would like to start learning about apologetics and figure out how they can serve uh, God using what they learn. Like, what would you say to them? You want to start, Chad? You want me to go? You go ahead. Okay. Um, Well, if it were books, the the likes of um, Lee Strobel's books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, The Case for Creator, The Case for uh, Fill in the Blank, um, all of those books are designed to, you know, it's release trouble um, is a journalist. So he interviews the apologists and uh, uh, the scientists and the people in those areas of expertise, giving reasons to believe. So that would be one thing if someone's into books or audio books, they could look at those books. And they've really stood the test of time the, a lot of these books have been around for some time now, but that's a. I mean, it's a, they're still popular and they're written at such a level where they will keep your interest without going too far over your head. And they'll give you a, uh, an overview of an argument for the creator or, you know, what Lee Strobel found in his, you know, interviewing people about um, the faith. So that would be one way to, to do it. Um, you could go to somewhere like Apologetics 315 or Truth Bomb Apologetics, different blogs like that, um, where certain topics are featured and you can search those topics and find a variety of resources um, along those lines. So there might be websites or blogs or um, podcasts that you can be directed to. As I say, now there's so many resources that, um, you know, wouldn't be too difficult to find them. Um, now it's just a matter of narrowing down, well, which one should I be listening to then? Um, or what should I, you know, should I trust this one or that one? So if you have other people, um, in your life who are into apologetics, check, check with them and say, Hey, what books would you recommend? Um, and I would say uh, there's another book by Paul Little. I think it's know why you believe. And another one called know what you believe. And those are, um, small but really uh concise impactful books um again they're a little older but you you can't beat them for accomplishing exactly what they were meant to do and just a great introduction to apologetics and um sure if if anybody wants advice on things to check out they can email us at podcast at apologetics 315 and we'll answer the questions on the podcast um and if they include a ghostbusters quote we guarantee 50% better quality answers. That's right. So, this is big, Peter. This is very big. Um, I would only add to that uh, real quick that uh, I would say that uh, as far as resources go, I would also add probably uh, J. Warner Wallace oh, yeah. in there. Uh, J. Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective, and his books are fascinating. It's almost like you feel like you're reading uh, like a crime novel and apologetics at the same time. He parallels a case that he actually solved with his investigation into different questions, whether it be God's existence, the reliability of the gospels, uh, things like that. And uh, just, they're so readable. And in our podcast with Jay Warner, I mean, one of the things he said was, was, you know, one of the reasons he writes his books like that is because he realizes people don't read as much as they used to. So he includes a lot of pictures. He makes it very engaging with the, the parallel of, of the investigation versus the apologetics. The way he words things, he kind of tries to keep the cookies on the bottom shelf. So those are some resources I would uh, uh, definitely recommend to a beginner 
and then also I would say one of the things that might be helpful because Brian mentioned, and I think it's a very valid point, that there are so many resources out there that honestly, when you start looking into apologetics, it can be overwhelming. Like you can feel like you're drowning in the fire hose, right? So one of the things you might want to do is, is pick a topic that you're most interested in, or maybe even you have doubts about and start with that. So for example, it might be the reliability of the New Testament. I know for me, it was that idea that when Paul said, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, your faith is in vain. Well, that was pointed out to me that Paul's basically saying like, hey, if, if he rose from the dead, this is true. If he didn't, it's false. And so for me, that was kind of the, the linchpin to look into. But uh, again, depending on where you're at, it might be a different uh, a place, but pick a topic you're interested in and focus on that. And maybe that'll be a little less overwhelming. And how, how would they be able to um, figure out how they can, you know, maybe they feel called to share some of the information they're um, learning? How, how could they kind of figure out, well, am I going to start a podcast? Am I a writer? Um, I, I uh, Oh, go ahead. Okay. Then I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> um, I think that uh, Greg Kokel, um is mentioned on his podcast, which is another one I'd recommend, uh, standtoreason.org. Stand to Reason podcast, str.org, Greg Kokel. Um, one of the greatest uh, resources of all time. Um, and his book, Tactics, uh, has to be mentioned as well. Oh. At, at any rate, um, well, if someone starts like getting into apologetics and they want to engage with others, and like you said, well, should I be a writer? Should I be this or that? This is kind of going back to what we were talking about with that book, a new kind of apologist. Uh, um, I think, number one, what are you good at? Like if, if you're not good at writing, don't do that. <laughs> you know, if you're good at m <clears throat> making websites or something, then they're like, hey, uh, hey, maybe I can help someone with the content. You know, uh, oh, this so-and-so is really good at writing stuff, but they don't know how to use a computer. <laughs> you know, uh, they don't know how to make a website or something. So, or if you've got a great voice, then you could do the audio version of it. The, the point is that you have to find what you're actually good at um, because you want to put out a decent product. Um, not to say it's essential, but it's a good sign. Um, the other thing, find out what you're passionate about. Uh, the, the thing that interests you most is the resurrection and you, you don't want to deal with sciencey stuff or cosmology or stuff, then, then don't go there. Um, focus on the things that really excite you. Me, pretty much everything does. So I'm a generalist. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there's certain, certain veins that I like to get into and, and focus on. But um, in that sense, as, as far as what you're, what you're focusing on, let your doubts, your questions, your interests, your passions uh, in the, those cer certain areas, guide you to those things. Let your skills be assigned as to what you can do, and then just I would say pray and ask God, where do you, where can I uh, be used in this way, and can you use me in this way? Would you use me in this way? And open the door, and then just start testing the knobs, you know, to see if they're locked. Um, and when something opens up, see where that might lead. And then uh, back to Greg Kokel, he would say, "Bloom where you're planted." Um, wherever you're at, there's something you can do. There's someone you can reach. Um, maybe it's a friend or an acquaintance or something like that. And you can have conversations. There's a sphere of influence that you have. So I think that when you um, start reaching the people within your sphere and being faithful with that, then the sphere uh, can expand. But it will never expand unless you're faithful with the smaller part. So that would be my suggestion is to use those sort of guidelines as a starting point um, and go from there. Yeah, I love that. My, my only thing I would add, I mean, you nailed that. I was uh, leaving only... it for you. Leaving yeah, it for you. No, it was great, man. Uh, seriously. I, I knew that's why I told you to go. Cause I was like, yeah, this is, this is Brian's question. He'll nail this. But um, the only thing I would add to that is um, just, you know, sometimes when you, you start an apologetics ministry, just, and again, this seems like, well, of course, Chad, uh, who wouldn't do that? But uh, Brian and I um, have talked about this before. When you start, Brian talked about how you're reaching that sphere of influence that you have when you begin. You know what? You uh, you might get into apologetics and uh, the, the, one of the people that you 
witness to and comes to Christ, mm-hmm. I mean, they might end up being the next Billy Graham, right? And so be careful to be careful not to get caught up in this idea that I need to have mm-hmm. this huge platform, that I need to have this, how can I monetize this? How can I brand this, right? Yeah. I encourage you not to get caught up in that and just think, Lord, how can I be faithful with what you've given me today? Um, and t- I think Brian's advice there, take that to heart because, um, uh, yeah, that that's where you can go to kind of figure out what it is he wants you to do, but just focus on being faithful to him and not trying to build your brand or whatnot. Yeah, that's a really good, um, good thing that Brian let you, you know, finish this conversation with. That was very generous of you, Brian. <laughs> um, anything else you guys would like to share and where can people learn more about what you guys do? Chad's blog can be found at truthbomb.blogspot.com. Uh, on there, he does a weekly thing where he gives uh, think apologetics and Christian worldview in the news. So a lot of different things happening in culture today or news stories that have sort of relevance to apologetics. He features those also good quotes, book reviews, links to debates and videos. So it's a nice little, uh, not a floodgate in your face with a zillion things, but steady feed of quality stuff and a lot of great timely, like timeless uh, book reviews and resources and things like that. So, you know, you could search by topic and you can go there and find all those sorts of things. Um, He's also on Twitter at Truth Bomb Apologetics, and uh, he's active there. I I just leave that to him. He's <laughs> he's he's guns akimbo uh, on Twitter. So um, yeah, I'd point point you guys over the, over there. Okay. Anything? Any last words, Chad? Uh, no. Just thanks a lot for having us on, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I feel like we have so much in common. Like we are passionate about um, apologetics and and uh, reaching other people um, with that uh, for the Lord. And um, so I'll leave Amen. all of the links in the description of this video. If you guys want to go check that out, I encourage you to do so. Thank you, Brian, so much, Chad, for um, giving me this time. And I, I really Absolutely. love this conversation so much. Hey, hey, one more thing. I just want to. Uh... Thank you for the interview, but also would encourage you with Girl Talk Apologetics and what you're doing uh, with that ministry. I see that as just wonderful and valuable. Yes. And um, keep keep doing it. It's it's definitely a, a good work. And all the stuff that you're posting on, on your YouTube channel as well, those things are, are valuable. And I'm sure that you're reaching an audience that, um, you know, me and Chad are not going to reach certain demographics but uh, i'm so glad right. you're in that space and doing apologetics and um um just uh really appreciate the privilege of being on your um, show here yes absolutely what he said <laughs> yeah thank you for the encouragement it's always appreciated so i hope you guys have a great day thanks you too Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. And we also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. And please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetics stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. Hey, Randy, what you doing? Oh, hey, Dave. I'm just making a list of things that make me feel really, really good. Wearing Bombas socks. Trust me, that's number one on my list. 
Bomba socks feel so good because we use the smartest design and best materials, making them the most comfortable socks ever. Plus, because socks are the number one most requested clothing item in homeless shelters, we donate a pair for every pair of purchase, and that feels pretty good too. To shop Bombas or learn more about how your purchase supports those experiencing homelessness, go to bombas.com slash comfy and get 20% off your first purchase. Hey, Randy, what you doing? Oh, hey, Dave. I'm just making a list of things that make me feel really, really good. Wearing Bombas socks. Trust me, that's number one on my list. Bomba socks feel so good because we use the smartest design and best materials, making them the most comfortable socks ever. Plus, because socks are the number one most requested clothing item in homeless shelters, we donate a pair for every pair purchased, and that feels pretty good too. To shop Bombas or learn more about how your purchase supports those experiencing homelessness, go to bombas.com slash comfy and get 20% off your first purchase.